Bonjour, good morning. Um, I'm very honored to, to participate in this wonderful event, and I congratulate all of the award winners and finalists. I must admit that I'm jealous, because we don't have anything quite like this in the United States. Um, I've been asked to speak about one of my favorite topics, and that's making history relevant. Um, This is the uh, main page, homepage of the History Relevance campaign website. That's a bunch of uh, kids in front of Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, our first president. And um, as, as they said, I am one of the co-founders of the History Relevance campaign, which is a relatively very new effort in the United States, but beyond to raise the profile of history. And Stephanie is exactly right. One of our b first big conversations happened here in Ottawa. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I forgot that, but at the National Council for Public History meeting in Ottawa. So at that point, we were just starting to talk about the challenge of and recognize the need for making history more relevant. And I know I'm preaching to the choir today, but I, I thought I would give you some insight uh, into, into our thinking uh, and how that has evolved over, over the years, several years, four years, I guess it is. So how did, all, how did it all start? So I work uh, in the shadow of that other capital to the south of here. Um, I work at the National Air and Space Museum, like they said, which is a history of technology museum. Um, but my background is history, and I felt bombarded with STEM constantly, science, technology, engineering, and math. All the funders talk about STEM, and at some point they added an A and wanted us to include the arts and make it STEAM around the Smithsonian. And I kept asking, where is the history? Where is the history? Why is the history being left out? And it just kept nagging at me. And, and finally, I started a broader conversation. And we began to think about brand. If STEM is a brand, it's a very, very strong brand. If history is a brand, it's not as strong as STEM. Why is that? So where is the history? What do people think of the past? What do people think of history? So we started by looking at several national studies that were done in the past years. And one was yours. I'm, I'm guessing you're all familiar with the, the last one on the list. Um, ours from in the US is from the late 90s, and so it's rather dated by now, we need a new one, and we're aware of that, but. Um, so we looked at, co at the comparison between them, and there were quite a few similarities between the countries. One was that a lot of people think history is boring, and they associate it with, sco with school, but they care about the past. They make this, this differentiation between the term past and history. Um, the book that came out of the U.S. study was called The Presence of the Past. I don't know if any of you have read that, but there was an intentional reason they, they called it The Presence of the Past, because people are more comfortable with the word the past than history. People like the past. So what were some of the implications uh, from the researchers who did these studies, and I'm not going to go into all the, all the ones on, on the PowerPoint, but some of them are the challenge to convince the public that we need more history in the classrooms. Um, we need to provide places where disputes about history can be facilitated. We need to be those places where we facilitate conversations about history. Some other ones, we need to link the past and present in an active, continuing dialogue. We need to work harder at listening to and respecting the many ways popular history makers traverse the terrain of the past. At the time we started these conversations, the movie Lincoln was playing, and a lot of people were going to see the movie Lincoln. 
And so we know that people like history. They will go to see movies like that. But what are they learning and what are they thinking about history after they've seen those movies? So the next question we asked was, what do we want out of this, this effort? I thought at this point, we didn't even know it was an effort. We just were having conversations. But what do we want? So we asked ourselves, in 15 to 20 years, we know that history was important and engaging because Americans would no feel do. What do we want them to know, to feel, and to do? So that was the very beginning of the conversations, and we got many different answers. Some of them, what would we want them to know? Well, we want them to know how to explore and think critically about history. We want them to understand that they are part of a larger world. We want them to know that to understand the present, you have to know the past. We wanted them to know that the experiences and historical engagement that will enhance their lives. And then to the feel part, empathy, hope. We want them to feel connected to others through a national consciousness. Other people's history is our history as well. We want them to be passionate about history as something that is hot, cool, awesome, or whatever the current term for hip is. Do, what would we want them to do in 15 to 20 years if history is important and relevant to them? We want them to be fighting for strong classroom education, historic preservation, and generally supporting their history institutions, no matter what size, wherever they're located. We want them to use history to make decisions about themselves and about their country and their local community. And we also want them to fund systems that are created to feel and know that history is important. So instead, instead of starting with the world, which was our initial vision, well, we have to just raise the profile of history, create a, a strong history brand. That's a little hard to do. It's very daunting. We decided to focus our efforts and uh, we're encouraged to narrow our focus to several audience. We started with the history field. We realized that we were not doing a good job of articulating our relevance. We needed a unified voice and a renewed effort to make connections between past and present. So we started a series of conversations at various conferences, um, which included our, um, our premier educa history education program, which is called National History Day, and that is for ages 12 to 18. And as a result of these conversations, we ended up with seven values of history. But let me back up for one minute and say, we came up with an impact goal, and this is what our impact goal was. People will value history for its relevance to modern life and use historical thinking skills to actively engage with and address contemporary issues. So as a result of these conversations, these are the seven values that we came up with. I should say we, we talked to academics, we talked to public historians, we talked to museum people all across the spectrum. We tried to hit, hit them all. And these are in your packet. Um, looks like this, the value of history statement. I'm going to talk about them briefly and then give some examples of them. These are not set in stone, I should say. We hope that people will adapt them to their own purposes. For some organizations, some are much more um, a priority than others. Um, some will place more emphasis on some of these values than others. So history is essential to ourselves. There are two values that fit into this category, identity, History enables people to discover their own place in the world. DNA research is really 
getting gaining in popularity, and that's all about identity, right? Trying to figure out what your identity is within the world. And then the other one is critical skills, historical thinking skills, multiple perspectives, critical thinking, validating sources to counteract the fake news. I'll say no more on that, but we all know the term fake news. Um, but this is where teachers come in especially, right? Let me take pause here to say that there is a reason that historical thinking is listed specifically in our impact statement. Remember that history is boring to some people, the term history, because it was taught that way. Why do we like history? Those of us in the room who are passionate about history, why do we like history? We like digging into the sources and doing the detective work. But too often we only share our conclusions from our research. We don't let people in on the fun. So we write a book and the book is our conclusions. We develop an exhibition. The exhibition is what we learn through our research. But we don't talk about process very often. And I think, I happen to believe that history sites and museums share the responsibility with formal education to teach historical thinking skills. That what does that look like and how do we do that is one of the challenges that we're starting to have more and more at, at, at conferences for public historians. We need to show the evidence and let people draw their own conclusions, make comparisons, ask questions, of course compare with what a professional historian has concluded, but people need to understand the process about how we arrive at our conclusions. The next values fall under the category, history is essential to our communities. So it, it fosters a vital, place, vital places to live and work. No place really becomes a community until it is wrapped in human memory. And then economic development. This is one we added toward the end of the conversation because we have a project with the National Governors Association. Governors have great influence when it comes to what history is taught in their state. And they are also, we are told, very interested in economic development. So that's one we added. People are drawn to communities that have preserved a strong sense of historical identity. And finally, the, la the last three values. Um, history is essential to our future. Engaged citizens, people who put their critical thinking skills into action in their communities engage in ways that benefit themselves and others. And they do this by researching, learning, and asking critical questions. They also bring history into discussions about contemporary issues. They know how to contextualize current problems. In a democracy, this is crucial. Um, the next value is leadership. History is filled with lessons about the characteristics of good and bad leaders and inspiring stories about how they met the challenges of their day. Historical thinking can be a crucial tool of leadership. And the final value is legacy. History saved and preserved is the foundation for future generations. Museums are keepers of local, state, and national legacy, authenticity, and memory. History is a set of resources that we can go to time and time again. These screenshots, by the way, are from a video about the values that was produced by the Indiana Historical Society, which is titled, History is Essential. So after we had these values, we decided to ask organizations to endorse them. We were hoping to spark conversations within history organizations in their leadership, in their volunteers who work for them, in their boards, we wanted to get people talking about history relevance and the value of history. So we asked people, organizations, I should say, not individuals, but organizations to endorse. And I'm happy to say that we are now at about 200 organizations that have endorsed um, the value of history statement, from small organizations to large organizations. Uh, even the Smithsonian, which I was very surprised because it's hard to get the Smithsonian to endorse anything. <laughs> And um, the U.S. National Archives have endorsed the value of history statement. 
I'm going to ask you in a few minutes if your organizations would also endorse the value history statement. Um, but what that means is, if you go on our website, you can see all of the different organizations that have endorsed it. We have libraries, archives, across the history spectrum, various organizations. So most important, the, the reason for this is we want people to say they're going to use the value of history statement. We want them to make it their own. We want them to adapt it, use pieces of it. We don't ask that you give us attribution, although that's always nice. Um, use its language, use its ideas, feel free to adapt, borrow, steal, improve it. Um, whether or not you take the formal step of endorsing it or not. We just want to have a unified conversation. So I want to give a few examples of organizations from the states that are trying to use the value statement. Um, here are three videos produced by three different states. They're available on YouTube. Um, where they've incorporated the value of history into a video about their organization. We also have a, a, a variety of resources that we're collecting and putting on the historyrelevance.com website. Um, different people talking about why history is important. There's a speech that uh, Steven Spielberg gave at Harvard University where he talks about the importance of history. Um, lots of different types of people talking on, in those videos. But how have, what are some other ways that organizations have used the value of history statement? This is a page from the 2016 annual report for Naper Settlement, which is a historic site near Chicago. And you can see that it's a beautifully designed piece for all of the organization's stakeholders. And right on the back of it, it incorporates the value of history statement. So this went out to all of their stakeholders. Another example is the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, which is the largest history organization in a very um, large state, Pennsylvania. And the director of the commission told us that he was inspired by the value of history statement to completely restructure his annual report recently. Instead of beginning internally with a report on each division and what they are working on, as staff might do, he decided to focus on impact externally and ask questions like, what are the outcomes of our work? Why do we matter in Pennsylvania? Some other examples of institutions that are trying to show history relevance in unique ways are, um, this is the Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site, which is in Philadelphia, and it's a historic prison. And they did an exhibition here. You can read about it. They're trying to show um, contemporary or prison history, comparing it with past prison history and looking at incarceration rates and starting a conversation comparing past and present. And they polled their visitors to see whether they liked the inclusion, uh, this inclusion of pres the present and present day statistics, or if it was too jarring for them, they wanted to stay in the past. And you can see the result here. Um, looks like 85% or so valued intensive contemporary content. And only a very few said it detracted from their experience. So people are open to this comparison of past and present. Another really interesting program that we use a lot as an example is Students Opposing Slavery, which is a student program, international student program, based uh, at President Lincoln's Cottage, which is a historic site um, that opened pretty recently, maybe 10 years ago. And it's, it uh, stands three miles north of the White House. And it's, it was a retreat for President Lincoln during his presidency. And it's really a museum of ideas because a lot of time, he spent a lot of time there thinking about the Emancipation Proclamation, which um, was issued in 1863 and freed the slaves during our Civil War. And so it's about that. And here you can see some more information about it, but 
They did a, an exhibition a few years ago about human trafficking, comparing past and present, talking about slavery today and educating visitors about slavery today versus what Lincoln was struggling with. And this became a program for teens, students opposing slavery, and it's going strong, I might add, and it's a, just a wonderful example of, of talking about the past, but also talking about the present, present and how they're connected. Here's another program that came to our attention um, from the Nashville Public Library, um, Civil Rights in a Civil Society program, which their target audience is chiefs of police around the country, around their city, I guess, to use lessons from history to imagine solutions to contemporary challenges. So getting the police involved in thinking about history and learning the history of, of injustice and justice and police actions. Here's another final example of an exhibit that opened at the Minnesota Historical Society about the Hmong people talking about immigration. Immigration is certainly a, a big topic that connects past and present. So what is the future? Um, where are we looking in the future for history relevance? Um, we're, we're trying to focus a lot about evaluation because we realize that we need more rigorous evaluation from historic sites that show history impact, our impact on relevance. We need a template with questions that we can get um, sites across the nation and museums across the nation using, um, which can start to give us a national perspective on how we are impacting people by showing history relevance. Um, all of these are challenging projects, and the road's not easy, but we need to, to be more um, intentional about measuring our impact. And so that, I would say, is the emphasis, our emphasis in the future. And again, I'm very thankful to share our work with you. And we welcome Canadian organizations, history organizations, to get involved in history relevance. It's not just a U.S. effort. Um, it's not a worldwide effort, but it's a North, it should be a North American effort. I know that Australians have contacted us, and they're very interested in copying what we're doing. But history should be relevant around the world, and it is relevant around the world. So we welcome you to um, check out our website, and to um, I'm happy to answer any questions about history relevance. Um, so thank you.